Uh, thank you, and it's really an honor to be here both in this session and this conference as, um, as a whole. Uh, so I am currently a postdoc with Rasmus Nielsen, and I will confirm he does really love frogs. Um, and this is work actually done with my PhD advisor, Noah Rosenberg. So admixture is ubiquitous throughout the animal kingdom. Almost kind of every group that we've studied, we can find some evidence of admixture or hybridization. I'm defining that here as uh, two or more source populations contributing to form a new, uh, what we call admixed or hybrid population. This includes two of the largest uh, groups in the United States, African American and Latino populations. And we're interested in it because it's really one of the most rapid mechanisms for substantial genetic turnover. Uh, this can lead to things like adaptive introgression, selection on a really fast time scale, as well as important for uh, conservation contexts through assisted gene flow. Admix populations have classically been thought of as statistical combinations of their source populations. Seen here, we have, uh, say, source population one of uh, red pentagons, source population two of blue triangles, they mix to create the squares, uh, these admixed populations, and we consider their allele frequencies as linear combinations of the allele frequencies in the source populations. Methods based on this approach have led to important progress, for example, to control for structure in GWAS, but they don't capture the complexity of the admixture process, which is what I'm really interested in, because admixture often varies over space and over time. So one of my overarching questions is, how, does, how do the processes that govern admixture shape variation within a hybrid population? One process I want to talk about today is uh, the parental pairing, which we know is often non-random. So this non-random mating within a population. This can be due to things like geographic, linguistic, or cultural assortment within a population, phenotypic preferences that might differ between the source populations, as well as inbreeding avoidance. I'm going to talk about a specific model of assortative mating. There are a lot of different ways one could think about assortative mating. Here we're considering a specific case of assortative mating, which is by population of origin. So here we can have individuals from source 1, S1, uh, which is, the uh, again, the red pentagons, source 2, the blue triangles, or the hybrid population, the purple squares. Within each generation, we are going to adjust the probability that a hybrid individual has a given pair of parents. So if this is kind of the overall pool of parents that a hybrid individual can have, they can mate in a couple different ways. They can mate randomly, which is what most models assume, um, either explicitly or implicitly, where sometimes you'll have uh, like mating with like, but sometimes not. And the mating pairs are really just um, occurring based on their frequency in the overall parental pool. You can have positive assortative mating, where you have this increased frequency of like mating with like over all the populations or some of the populations. Or you can have negative assortment, where you have um, like mating with dislike. And this assortative mating by population model can be thought of in a few different ways and is kind of motivated by the uh, empirical examples where we have preference uh, for or against new migrants to an admixed population. It's also seen in examples where you have geographic barriers, like the admixed population occurring on an island or occupying a different plant or animal host environment. Um, in human populations, there can be cultural or linguistic differentiation, where the admixed population really functions as its own unit. This has been seen in areas with kind of strong classification systems, often not scientifically founded, for example, in my home country of South Africa. Um, importantly, um, there's also uh, somewhat controversial, it's somewhat controversial the extent to which hybrid um, speciation occurs in the wild, but both empirical and um, theoretical examples uh, propose assortative mating as a primary mechanism uh, to this process. So we're going to study this by looking at genetic signatures of admixture and how they vary with assortative mating versus random mating. And what I mean by genetic signatures of admixture is this. So if we have, for example, one individual who has a parent from the blue population and a parent from the red population, the F1 will be a mix of these two. Over time, with potentially more admixture um, and recombination breaking up these blue and red ancestry tracts within the genome, you'll end up with a population of individuals whose chromosomes are mosaic structures, for example, like this one individual. Um, we're studying a summary statistic, which I'm calling the ancestry proportion um, or the admixture fraction. So in this case, it's say the sum of all the red components in this individual here is about 60% of their ancestry. And for the same admixture history, a 
population will likely vary um, with different numbers around a mean full distribution of what this uh, ancestry proportion will be. We're going to study the summary statistic in a mechanistic model. So we have uh, the red population and the blue population combining um, to create an admixed population in a first generation. We have discrete generations uh, with potentially more or varying contributions from the red and blue source populations to the admix population. Each of these arrows is parameterized by sex-specific contributions with males and females potentially migrating at different rates over time, and as I said, it's in discrete generations. In this final generation, we're studying the distribution of our summary statistic, the ancestry proportion within a population. For example, here, it's just an example plot of blue ancestry, which, as I said, will likely vary throughout the population. We can calculate exactly what that distribution should be. For example, looking at the probabilities of all the mating pairs. So again, we have three populations that the uh, parents can come from, source one, source two, or the hybrid population. So going through one example, if we have both parents from source population one, so in this column, uh, source one is the mom, source uh, one is the dad, you'll have a probability of parental pairing, initially uh, like random mating, where you have just the frequency of moms from S1 times the frequency of dads from S1. And then we add this assorted of mating parameter, which is the CIJs. So I and J are just the source populations. It can be one, two, or hybrid. And this can be negative for negative assortment, so you're just decreasing the probability of seeing this pair relative to random mating. It can be zero to uh, replicate random mating, or it can be positive, as in positive assortative mating. Once we know the probability of having a given parental pair, then an individual's ancestry is straightforward, assuming um, like infinite chromosomes. So an individual's ancestry given uh, a parental pair is just the average of their mom and dad's ancestry. Um, this is true for the autosomes and the X chromosome in females. The X chromosome in males, you inherit your uh, mom's ancestry directly. If your parent is from the hybrid population, we uh, treat it as a random variable, and it's just a random draw from the previous generation's distribution. We can write this out for all nine possible parental pairs, just the probability of having a given set of parents. So there are nine possible pairs given um, the three populations your parents can come from. So you return to our initial question of how these processes um, that govern admixtures shape a hybrid population, and we can, under this model, make them a little more concrete. So we want to know how does assortative mating impact the distribution of ancestry within a population? And a little more specifically, uh, what downstream effects would unaccounted for assortative mating have on inference of population history? Um, because this distribution of ancestry in a population is often used to infer um, parameters of migration and the timing of admixture. So I'm uh, going to skip ahead and give you one result straight off the bat, that mean ancestry in the population is exactly equal to, you can prove this with a set of equations, that of a corresponding randomly mating population. By corresponding, I mean that the contribution parameters and migration rates are the same. So sort of mating does not affect mean ancestry in the population at all. And this makes sense when you think that the average ancestry over all individuals in the population just depends on the pool of parents, not who's mating with whom, which is all that we're changing under this assortative mating model. But the rest of the distribution, the higher moments, do change. So to look at that, we're going to analyze two special cases to get exact solutions under our model. The first is a single admixture event, where you found the hybrid population but have no further contributions. The second is a constant migration after founding model. Under these models, we can solve for closed form solutions for the moments of the distribution of ancestry in the population. And these exact solutions are important to identify kind of which parameters the moments depend upon. And we can also prove long term behavior by having exact solutions and down the road perform uh, fast inference under the model by having these closed form solutions. So our results. First, positive assortative mating increases the variance an ancestry within a population, while negative assortment decreases the variance. We can see this plotted here. So we, on the x-axis, we have the number of generations since the admixture event occurred in a single admixture model, so no further contributions, and the variance of autosomal ancestry within the population on the y-axis. Random mating is this dotted line, where for a given generation on the x-axis, positive assortative mating is always higher, and negative is always lower than that of an equivalent random mating population with the same migration rates. We can see this in the set of equations, where we have the variance of autosomal ancestry 
ancestry. It looks a little like a Bernoulli variance with this added term um, that it's directly related to the C11 or how uh, the change in uh, mating practices based on S1 mating with itself. We also note that um, with each generation, there's this two to the G term where each generation kind of mixes and the long-term limit goes to zero when there's no further contributions. This pattern also holds for constant migration. So this is the same plot with the timing, of ad timing since admixture started on the x-axis and the autosomal variance on the y-axis. We see that uh, random mating in this dash line, positive assortment increases and negative assortment decreases. Unlike a uh, single admixture event, it goes to a long-term limit rather than zero, however, because there's constant contributions from the sources. Notably, there's a smaller effect on the X chromosome, so these are for the same parameter values. The difference between um, the kind of the space between the lines of the random mating line um, and the positive or negative assorted mating line are smaller on the X chromosome, and this makes sense if you think about the inheritance pattern of the X chromosome, where males just inherit their mom's um, like X chromosome. It doesn't matter who uh, they're mating with, so the parental pair has less of an effect um, on the X chromosome than it does on the autosomes. So this can um, be important for things like contrast uh, populations where, say, sex bias admixture and assortative mating are happening at the same time and can affect the X and the autosome in um, opposite ways. This may um, be familiar to some of you because uh, these results where the mean kind of stays the same but the variance changes in this predictable way is reminiscent of models of assortment based on single locus genotypes where genotype frequencies change um, but not the allele frequencies. So the pairing but not the overall mean. Um, this is similar where the variance in genotypes increase in the population driven by um, largely by this excess of homozygotes. Similarly, we're driven by this excess of, say, source one mating with source one and source two with source two, so these zeros and ones in the ancestry distribution. So we have this idea that positive assortative mating increases the variance, but it's not always true. Um, under our model, we demonstrate that this concept of assortative mating is kind of ill-defined, it's underspecified. So there are more um, variables that you have to explain than what we really do when we usually think about assortative mating, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, for example, uh, using one example. So here is the same plot where we have the onset of admixture, uh, time since the onset of admixture on the X chromosome, or on, on the X axis, and the variance of autosomal ancestry on the Y axis. And we see a case here where despite C11, the preference for S1 to itself, and despite uh, CHH, the hybrid population for itself, both being positive. So this is what many people would consider assortative mating. We have this example here where the um, variance is smaller than that of the dashed line here, random mating. So what's going on? Well, in this case, C22 is substantially more negative, so it's more dis uh, disassortative mating, then you have assortative mating in the other two populations. So you have parameters you have to define in all these populations at once. So when we think about assortative mating, it might not just be um, in our population of interest, but multiple populations at the same time. Uh, more generally, we can say that um, for, say, a uh, given uh, type of definition of assortative mating, say CHH is always positive, we can always find a set of assortative mating parameters um, that either increases, decreases, or makes the same variance as a random mating population with the same migration rates. Plotting that, just as an example, um, if you specify C11, uh, so the preference for S1 for itself as positive, um, I think it was about 0.01, you can see here for all values of CHH and C1H, um, sometimes you have above zero and sometimes you have below zero, the difference between the variance in an assortative mating population and a random mating population. Finally, what does this mean for inference, particularly in the timing of admixture? So we recall this uh, equation where the variance of autosomal ancestry um, is defined, and it has this dependence on uh, G, the number of generations since the onset of admixture in a single admixture event. We can solve for G and get an estimator for the timing since admixture given a known or uh, a sample estimated variance, and we see this direct relationship with the assortative mating parameter. What that looks like is if you have a toy population where the variance is, say, 0.06, um, if you assume random mating, you would um, estimate uh, that G is 2. Um, but depending on if assortative mating was uh, negative or positive, you could be over or underestimating uh, the true population history um, quite substantially.
Generally, positive assortative mating looks more recent than the truth, as assortative mating will uh, maintain variation in the population and look like admixtures quite recent. We think that this may contribute to underestimates of African-American admixture using these methods. Um, for example, it's been estimated that uh, the onset of admixture was something like uh, seven generations or 200 years ago, which we know historically is not true. So to sum up, we know that positive assortative mating generally increases the variance while negative decreases it, and this is reminiscent of um, classic models of allele frequency assortative mating. However, it's not always true when we have to think about how we define these variables, especially when we're talking about inference. And with that, I want to thank you for listening and particularly thank my PhD advisor, Noah, and co-authors on this and related work.